My Lupus Living Room is a place to listen to the stories of ordinary, everyday people who are not afraid to share the struggles and successes of living with a chronic illness called lupus. These brave lupians put it all out there to bring us all in. We celebrate people living with lupus. My name is Suzanne. I am a mom, a wife, a business owner, and the CEO of the Lupus Foundation of America's Great Ohio Chapter, and a whole lot more. But most of all, I have lupus. My purpose and my passion are to help other people with lupus. For me, lupus was a lonely, miserable, misunderstood disease. And I'm here to tell you that today, it doesn't have to be. I want to talk more about the things we do not normally talk about. Since lupus impacts mostly women, my lupus living room will have a focus on what it's like to be a woman living with this mysterious, unpredictable disease that has no cause or cure. I know that many would love to connect with others that have lupus. These women are fearless and have extraordinary stories of survival. I'm excited to welcome my not-so-famous guests and with their inspiring stories that offer hope and inspiration to fellow lupians. I believe this project will not only create awareness about lupus, but offer encouragement to those listening. Remember, there is no I in the word lupus, but there is the word us. The Lupus Foundation of America, Great Ohio Chapter, is here for you. For your chance to share your story and visit with me, you can reach out to me at Suzanne at Lupus Great Ohio or call 1-888-NO-LUPUS. So for now, sit back, relax, and enjoy. Welcome to my Lupus Living Room. I'm Alex, the Digital Assets Manager here at the Lupus Foundation of America, Greater Ohio Chapter. And today I am joined by Lisa Briding. Um, Lisa is a Lupian and also a facilitator and a patient navigator here at the chapter. Um, So welcome, Lisa. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. So we're going to get into Lisa's story today, um, a little bit about you know, her journey with lupus, um, diagnosis and everything like that. And then also how she found the chapter and got involved with the chapter. Um, Before we kind of get into the conversation, though, as we always do, just remember that anything we discuss here today is just meant to be um, informative and kind of entertaining um, and insightful. Um, Any medical information that may arise from the conversation um, should be uh, not taken into account without speaking to your medical team. Sorry, I struggled to get that thought out of my head. (laughs) But um, yeah, so just remember that whenever you're listening to the podcast. All right. So um, Lisa, so obviously, as I mentioned, you are a Lupian. Um, Can you just share your your journey with lupus um, as far as when you started showing symptoms kind of into your diagnosis and kind of what that was like? Certainly. I, um, you would think would be at the healthiest of my life. I had been working out, um, riding bicycles with some friends and my sister Mm -hmm. multiple times a week, um, had lost 55 pounds and was eating healthy. And over the course of a summer, just got drastically ill. Hmm. Um, we would, speaking of the bike rides, there was one in particular that had multiple hills and I could make it up all the hills, but the biggest one. And that was my goal for that summer was by the end of the summer, I would make it up the hills. Well, by the end of the summer, my sister was making it up all the hills and I had to literally walk or sit the hills out because I was getting worse. Um, It was also a time to where I was starting to go through a divorce. So I thought it was stress and everything. Mm -hmm. And, But even as that calmed down, my physical symptoms got worse. I was extremely achy. Um, I couldn't sleep. I had joints that were all swollen and red, Um, headaches daily, dizzy spells. Um, I finally went to my doctor thinking that something had to change because if I was eating right and doing everything that the doctors Mm -hmm. would tell me to do, why was I feeling so crappy? And Thankfully, I had a very good doctor who actually listened and paid attention to everything I was telling her. And she ran a lot of lab work and 
went down through the lab work two weeks later and she was telling me all the things she had tested for, which I can't even remember <laughs> how it all came out negative. Right. And then she just stopped talking and I thought she was done and I started crying and she's like, Oh, sweetie, what is wrong? And I said, I have to go home and tell my husband and my kids that everything's okay. I said, they already think I'm crazy that I'm making all this right. up for attention. Right. And she put her hand on my knee and kind of tapped lightly. And she said, no, sweetie. She said, this is where I tell you, you have lupus. Hmm. And I just knew a little bit about lupus, but I was actually very relieved when yeah. she told me that I had it. Um, so three months later, I ended up at the rheumatologist for my um, mult multitude of lab work again with the <laughs> rheumatologist because, of course, they have to check for everything right. also. And it was confirmed that I did have lupus. Hmm. So we started on the Plaquenil and everything, which is typically your, your first line of defense. But it was it was a blessing for me to find out what was going on. Yeah. Um, and like I said, I knew a little bit about lupus, so I wasn't wasn't scared. I knew right. knew that I could go from mild to serious, but I yeah. I had somebody that I knew as a child that had lupus and she was still doing relatively well. Mm. So, but yeah, that's how my journey started. Looking mm. back, we kind of figure that I may have had it as early as 12 because mm -hmm. there were a lot of instances through my life to where I was sick or, you know, seeing an orthopedic surgeon at 12 because of bad knees and yeah. they weren't sure what was wrong and right. different things, but it's, it's been a good journey for me. And um, how, <clears throat> if you mentioned this and I missed it, I'm sorry. Um, how how long ago was this? Were you diagnosed? I was diagnosed by my um, PCP in 2012 and then confirmed by my rheumatologist in 2013. Okay. So it, 10 years ago. Okay. And you said um, something I picked up on. You had said that it was over the course of a summer yeah. of exercising and stuff. So that's... So were you diagnosed initially by your PCP, like at the end of that summer, or like in the fall or something? Yeah, in September. That's, wow, that's, yeah, I, I mean. I was going to say for me, it was a, a quick, yeah, a quick lupus journey. Um, I know yeah. the average is six to seven years for a patient to get diagnosed in multiple doctors. Right. And that's why I said, for me, it, it was a blessing. One, yeah. because I got the diagnosis. Mm-hmm to prove that something was wrong. Yeah. And then also because mine was so quick. Yeah. Um, but I think what helped was the PCP that I was seeing at that time knew somebody right. in her life that had lupus. Yeah. And that was one of the very first things that she said when I listed off all my symptoms and she, I had been a patient for three years. So she had already known right. had a history, about my weight yeah. loss and, you know, how my, my health, over three years had improved from being essentially a couch potato to <laughs> right. somebody trying to be active. Yeah. Um, so that helped a lot having that, yeah. that um, medical history with her and her knowing somebody that had lupus is to what yeah, to check can, for. Yeah. But yeah, that, that quick diagnosis is not typical for lupus patients. Yeah. That's, I mean, it always, I always find it funny because you know, when, at the chapter when we're out in the community and stuff and we meet somebody at an event or something and anything to do with lupus like if you meet somebody that's like oh my my sister or anybody has lupus you almost get like excited yeah. and it feels weird because <laughs> you're like oh my god that's amazing but not you know but yeah um so yeah no that's that's kind of funny and that's something else i picked up on too that i've heard suzanne as well have a, as a lot of other uh lupus patients say um over the course of my time here is that you were relieved almost when you got diagnosed, you know, there was like a relief where it's like, Oh, yeah. like you, you knew what was going on at least, you know, that, you know, you knew something was wrong, but now you knew what it was. Exactly. And I, I think just having that diagnosis, mm -hmm. um, or, you know, even if it's not lupus, but yeah, when anything. you're, when you're sick and you yeah. get a diagnosis, it's just that relief in mm -hmm. a way, because you know that you're not crazy yeah. and, you know, even if whatever you have, especially with lupus, there's no cure, but we've got so many new medications now right. that help us live a better life. Yeah. So, yeah, no, hundred um, percent. So that was about 10 years ago. And mm -hmm. has it, 
you know, has it been relatively mild in your case, or have you gone kind of through the roller coaster over the course of a decade? My first four to five years was pretty rough. Mm -hmm. um, we tried multiple medicines. It took a good five to six years to find the right medicines for you're me. Right. Yeah, you're right, mix. Um, also, we had to throw in a couple medicines that aren't for lupus because we found out I had some autoimmune diseases piggybacking mm. on lupus, which is yeah, common. Yes. Yeah. So, but yeah, um, for me, my lupus is mild compared to some patients mm -hmm. and I'm very thankful for that. Yeah. And one thing that when I was diagnosed with lupus, I said that it may slow me down. It's not going to stop me from living. Yeah. And I try to focus on that daily, even mm -hmm. on my bad days yeah. because it's, you know, right. That's part of what helps keep me going. going yeah. So yeah, it gives yeah. You purpose. And on my bad days, I try to remember that my bad lupus days are somebody else's good lupus day. Mm -hmm. And I have to be thankful for that. I've developed a lot of friendships with other lupians through mm -hmm. the years and I see their struggles. Yeah. And I, I'm very thankful for my lupus journey because, yeah. you know, could be a lot different. It could yeah. be a lot different. And it is a lot different and, for a lot of other yeah, people. It yeah, it is. I'm mm -hmm. one of the lucky ones. Yeah. Um, well, that's and at the time were you because i know you mentioned you um when you were talking to beth uh before as i was getting everything set up you were in kansas at one point i ended so, up moving to kansas for three years okay and then so, came back but i was you in were ohio. in ohio yeah okay. okay um and then as far as you know so you're you're diagnosed you're going along your journey um when when did you find uh the ohio chapter or um you know, when, when did you find the lupus community in Ohio and how did that come about? Um, after my confirmation from the rheumatologist was, which was January of, um, 2013, mm -hmm. my, I didn't know what to do. I had looked at lupus online. Like I said, I knew just a little bit about it from mm -hmm. knowing somebody as a kid that had it. Um, my sister actually found the lupus foundation for me. Mm. And I sent away for the information packet. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I had found out about was the lupus walk. Mm -hmm. So I went to my first one in 2013, which was actually the last one at the Metro parks here in Brooklyn. Yeah. Right. Right in the backyard. Yeah. We could see it. So <laughs> I was so impressed with the walk that I ended up finding out about the support groups there mm -hmm. and it just continued. Yeah. Um, I wanted to be able to learn as much about lupus as I could. Mm -hmm. So I started volunteering with the walks. Mm -hmm. um, I came up here a few times when they put out a call for people to come and stuff envelopes. And <laughs> yeah. I went to, um, surprisingly, I have never attended the um, new patient orientation. Oh. <laughs> um, but when I started, um, we had an employee named Marnie and mm -hmm. she was here and she had done some 10 week course down at the library in Cog Falls. Mm -hmm. And I attended that, which was the last time I believe we did that course. Hmm. But um, yeah, I just, the going as a patient and hitting the support groups, it was like, I just felt that need to where I needed to help whatever way I could yeah. and help spread awareness. And yeah. I just, it's, it's, been a blessing in my life because like I said, I've, I've met some good friends. Um, yeah. it helps me out. I suffer through depression also and, mm -hmm. and getting around even virtually or in person talking to other people. It's, yeah. it makes your lupus journey a little easier. Not knowing. Alone. Yes. Yeah. So 100%. we all have different things going on in our lives and our symptoms mm -hmm. and our disease course may not be the same, but you've got that similarity, which really helps knowing that somebody you can relate to is out there and you can reach out to them when you need to. Yeah. And I like being able to be there for others. Yeah. I mean, and I'm sure it's almost, um, um, Th not therapeutic, but like uh, comforting and knowing that, you know, obviously, as you said, nobody's lupus is the same. Um, and it's certainly not the same at the same time. So, exactly. you know, if you're, you're going through a flare, you're going through a struggle with something and you talk to somebody that maybe is at a good spot at, at this point in their journey, but they're like, oh yeah, you know, a year and a half ago, I was the mm -hmm. exact same way. And this is what worked for me. This is kind of how I stayed motivated or got through it or whatnot. Right. You know, I'm sure there's a lot of comfort and, you know, catharsis in that. 
Um, and just knowing that, you know, like we said, you're not alone, but also, you know, you're not, th this isn't only happening to you that way. Exactly. You know? um, so, and especially for the new patients coming in, yeah, they really get an opportunity to talk or even just listen to mm -hmm. other lupus patients and find out that, you know, what they may have thought was going to be a death sentence since so many people don't know what's entailed with lupus. Yeah. That, you know, they can lead a good life and, yeah. you know, they may have some rough parts, but you could also have a smooth part, you mm -hmm. know, it's, so yeah. Yeah, it's really almost... important to get around people that experience what you experience and, yeah. Hear their stories. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and support group wise, um, you know, when you got involved with the chapter, were you, did you attend the Brexville support group or was it a different group? I first started at a Stowe branch. Okay. Um, and then went to the Akron support group. Okay. So I attended Akron and Brexville. Okay. Um, I liked both of them for different reasons. Yeah. Um, Akron is a smaller group, mm -hmm. which usually has the same people most of the time. Mm -hmm. So you actually get more of a one-on-one -on -one of being able to talk to everybody right. and get to know them a little closer. Yeah. Um, Bruxville, I came up here for the meeting all the time because there were topics that Suzanne, well, when I came, Suzanne was the mm -hmm. facilitator and she always made sure that we were learning something right. and that really helped, you know, so I enjoyed both of them. Yeah. And then they were, it was brought up to me, would I be a backup facilitator if mm -hmm. somebody ever needed it? Yeah. And from there it just branched off. Um, I ended up helping Suzanne out as her backup when she needed it mm -hmm. because of her busy schedule. Right. And when she eventually stepped down from being facilitator of the Bruxville group, I mm -hmm. took over. Um, I help out with Akron when needed. Mm -hmm. Then she started a prayer group. Mm -hmm. So I started co-facilitating that with Kat. And then the monthly call in started back <laughs> up. And Suzanne asked if we would I'm take sensing over a that. theme here. <laughs> and what a lot of people don't know other than Suzanne and a couple others is that I'm looking at starting up a support group in Portage County because we've shown some interest for Portage County. Nice. So that's still in the works, but hopefully that's that awesome. will be coming up soon. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's just, it's important to me. I see, see so many patients that, you know, they need, or even just want yeah. that support. Yeah, and they don't like know I where to ask. you know, when I talk to Lupians that haven't been there for a while, they're like, well, I'm in a good place. I don't need the support group. Yeah. And I've even explained to them that, you know, they may not need that support group right now, mm -hmm. but somebody else might need them to be there. Yeah. And that's the one nice thing about a support group is, you know, we become like a family and yeah. we're there for each other. You know, there's months where I go and just listen to somebody else's story mm -hmm. yeah. teaches me something or, you know, they may say or do something that just gives me that little boost that I need. Mm -hmm. So I, I always encourage people to connect with the support group because you don't know, you could be helping somebody else yeah. that month. Yeah, that's interesting. That's something that I hadn't really considered is like, you know, it, Obviously, you know, attending is beneficial for many reasons, but, you know, it might not just be for you, yeah. you know, like just because you need it necessarily. I never really thought about it that way that, yeah. you know, you're helping somebody else just by even being there. It took me a, a while before and I, I don't remember when exactly or, or what happened, but mm. it was it was a couple of years ago that it just clicked one day that it's like you're you're helping somebody else by being here, yeah. you know, and sometimes that's that's why you need to go. So. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. Um, but what I was getting at with the Brexville group, obviously I knew that you're the facilitator there, but I was, I was getting in ever since, uh, since I mentioned this, she has now walked in the room. So I'm putting you on the spot, <laughs> but I always, I always want to know, like, I always wonder, and I never get a chance to ask anybody, but like, so the first time you meet Suzanne, right? So like, obviously she's not, she's not shallow. She's, <laughs> she's nervous now. Don't worry. This is going to be good. 
she's not shy about you know expressing that she has lupus you know mm -hmm. to i mean she'll tell the waiter at the restaurant i've seen it you know but anybody that'll listen yeah. postman somebody walking by somebody shovel on the sidewalk you know she's <laughs> she waves the flag for you know all the lupians in ohio but so you see her you, you know that she has lupus at the time you're newly ish diagnosed mm -hmm. going through your journey you don't know what the heck's going on maybe you're not you mentioned you struggled for five or six years and you see this woman just like a her we call her hurricane suzanne oh, yes. sometimes <laughs> so what i like does that i mean does that encourage you does that make you want to like crawl in a hole and cover up with a blanket and like i don't know what i'm doing this lady's running circles oh, around no. me. Like, I, what you... <laughs> i've told her before she's like one of my heroes yeah because she's you know the way i put she does it all yeah. you know she's working mm -hmm. she's has her family and she's a hero or a mentor a huge mentor to all mm -hmm. of us and her compassion for all of the lupians is mm -hmm. just amazing yeah. but yeah i i told her before that when i grow up i want to be like her <laughs> oh, only not working so much right but yeah. no i mean and she does she tells you she has lupus and that you know she like you said she's not afraid to tell anybody mm -hmm. and she tells us all you know the struggles that she's been through yeah and to me that's a huge encouragement because mm -hmm. it it shows me and everybody else that you know you can do it yeah. you know you're gonna have ups and downs you're gonna have pity parties mm -hmm. um you know life throws us curveballs yeah but you know we take it in stride and you know like i've told people i take it day by day yeah hour by hour minute by minute um i was telling one of our newer lupians on our virtual mm -hmm. tuesday night that it's okay to have a pity party i have my pity parties yeah but the one thing you've got to remember is you can't let yourself get in. You can't stay there. Yeah, it you can't know? be a lifelong pity yeah. party. Yeah. You know, take an hour, take a day, take a weekend. I yeah. do it now. Right. Um, it, but you've got to keep going. Yeah. You know, and that's what's important. She keeps going and she keeps us going. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah. Yeah, yeah no, the, the. She's a force to be reckoned with. You know, <laughs> we all know. It, it doesn't take long to figure that out for sure. Um, you yeah, know, I, that was just something I had to bring up. And, I was determined to do it once you walked in the room then too, because I thought it would be funny. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's, I think that's something the, the lifelong pity party versus take a day, take a weekend. Um, I think that's actually something in the last five to 10 years, you know, kind of started with everybody being more comfortable um, expressing mental health challenges and yes. things like that. I think it's actually um, one of the good things is all the chaos in the world and all around us has seemed to unravel. Um, it's one of the few good things that has come about, like as far as like uh, societal norm is like now it's more acceptable for people to do that, you yes. know, um, you know, more talked about just for anybody, loopy yeah. or not. Um, you know, if you need a day, take a day. If you need yes. a weekend, take and a weekend. It, it's critical to your health. Yeah. I mean, in mm -hmm. all aspects, mental, emotional, physical. Yeah. It's, it's really important. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I agree. And loopians with us being chronic, chronic illness patients we have a higher rate of depression mm -hmm. and you yep. you've got to be considerate to yourself as well as others and yeah you know not put yourself on the back burner all the time mm -hmm. you've got to make sure that your health is taken care of yeah and, and i mean a lot of means, times first yeah you know i mean you know you're not going to be able to help too many people if you're not feeling well exactly so. You know, take care of take care of me first. And me Su first is okay sometimes. <laughs> yes, <and> Su <laughs> Suzanne will tell you, and I'll just I'll I'd say she's over here because she knows. <laughs> I I will preach at all my support groups. You know, you got to put yourself first, mm -hmm. and I am a number one caretaker, mm -hmm. and I really struggle with putting my own health at first. Yeah, but I've been trying. You know, there's been weekends over the last six months to where. I'm vegging in my bedroom, binging Hallmark movies because mentally and physically, I know that I just cannot do you don't it. Have it in you. Yeah. 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 And so, Suzanne does the same thing. She'll yeah. call at 11, uh, 11 o'clock or whatever. We're like, I wonder where she is. And she's like, I don't feel good. Yeah. I'm not coming in today. I was going to, but she always works from home and stuff and does what she can. But she, 
She yeah. has that that whiny when you hear the whiny, uh, I don't. You already know what it's going to be. Yeah. It's fine. You know, it's absolutely. It's, yeah, we we have staff members here that look out for me, and they get on mm -hmm. my case because I, I you know, they tell. Can tell. Every, yeah. I don't do what I tell everyone to do. But, yeah, you know. exactly. Practice what you preach. Exactly. Well, neither neither does she too. <laughs> as as much as as much as she'll get on her on everybody else's case but about it, she doesn't always do that. It, too. It's you hard know? when you're a caretaker. Yeah. You know, and and mm -hmm. that's what. You know, my my job is taking care of my grandson and mm -hmm. my great nephew. And my great nephew is, you know, has ASD mm -hmm. and I live with my mom and she has dementia. So now mm -hmm. I'm her part time caretaker. Yeah. But even just as a mom, you, you grow up yeah. learning to take care of everybody. It's 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 a challenge to put yourself yeah. first. Well, and so, you can, you know, you can even argue that as a, a facilitator and a navigator, you're a caretaker in that yes. role as well. You yeah, know? exactly. Um, so, so that's, but yeah, that's, that's a theme in your life. I've been, sure. I've been <laughs> making a bigger effort over the last six months of, you know, practicing what I preach. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think it's fine, like, too, with it, you go through uh, seasons, you know, almost like the weather where it's like, all right, well, for the next very true couple months you know i know i'm gonna be busy so like probably not gonna be feeling the best after it but then you know exactly. make a conscious effort for the next couple months after that it's like all right yeah everybody leave me alone like you know <laughs> as, as best as you can but um yep. you know obviously so you know there's it's always gonna ebb and flow like that um I, I've even learned how to use the do not disturb and the, <laughs> the mute on my phone. And my children have even said, you know, I've been trying to get a hold of you. And it's like, sorry, I did not pick up my phone for eight hours. It was, yeah, really. it was on silent. Yeah. I just needed that time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's perfectly okay. Um, kind of back to the support groups. What what have you found? I know we've, <clears throat> we've kind of touched on it a little bit, but is somebody, how long have you been a facilitator for? Let's see, three years. Okay. And over the course of that time, three like four years, seeing new people come to the group, uh, groups and, you know, people that have been coming there. What is, is there like a constant theme um, that you see from people that like what they're looking for when they first, like, is, is there anything yeah. that you know? Yeah. I was going to say <laughs> a, like... a, a lot of times it's that they're not alone. Yeah. You know, they, some patients will have people that they can talk to all the time and other patients, you know, they, their families are there helping, but they just don't understand. Yeah. It's and, that, that common thing that we have with everybody is that empathy. Yeah. You know, we can feel, feel for another Lupian mm -hmm. or, you know, it just, but yeah, the, that's the main thing is yeah. they, they need to be heard and they need their feelings or what they're feeling to be felt by somebody else yeah so that they know that they're not alone yeah and un i think understood is because yes. you know i mean <clears throat> somebody that and this goes for anything in life but like you know if you listen to somebody the most common thing to say is like oh you know i understand i get it but like do you really you know yeah. like that's sometimes it's like well you can't yeah you know unless, 100%, unless you're in that yeah. in that same journey you can't right and you know we may like we had touched on earlier, we don't all have the same symptoms. We don't mm -hmm. go through the journey the same way, but there's that commonality to where we can feel what somebody else is feeling and yeah. know that you're not alone, you yeah. know? And some of the, the patients that I deal with are coming to us right when they get diagnosed mm -hmm. and others I've talked to recently that it's the first time they've had lupus, you know, even a couple decades. Yeah. But this is the first time they're reaching out because that's what they need is they don't have anybody in their life that's understanding. Right. They've got the support physically mm -hmm. and, you know, they some of them are working, some are staying home, but they don't have anybody in their life that feels the way that they do. Yeah. So and that's yeah. important is mm -hmm. to have that. Well, or, you know, as you uh, mentioned uh, you know, people that have been diagnosed for decades that are just now finding their way to a support group. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe they had somebody in their life that, you know, maybe a relative had That's lupus true. or whatever, or maybe they had a really, really good caretaker. They were really lucky, but maybe that person's passed away or for whatever reason, no Very longer true. in their life. Yes. So now they need it because they've, they've always had it and mm -hmm. now they're craving that. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's a, that's an interesting, interesting point to make. Um, and then as far as, cause I've, I've attended, um, new patient education with Rita, but I've never attended a support group. So is I'm, 
uh, just curious, and I'm sure other people are if they haven't been to one. How how does it run? So like, is it is it just like an hour, two hour long vent session, or is there a structure? <laughs> or are they all a little bit different depending um, on what people need? They're they're a little different. Um, we have multiple um, support group facilitators, mm -hmm. and I'm sure we don't all run them all the same way. Right. Um, I I can tell you even just with the ones that I help facilitate they're different. You know, the, we live with lupus. We meet in person up mm -hmm. here in Brecksville. Yep. Um, I try to run it the way that Suzanne used to and have topics that we talk right. about or an activity that we do every other month. Mm -hmm. um, but even the one thing that they all do have in common, whether we're in person or virtually or on the phone is that everyone gets a chance to say what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we all need to vent. Yeah. Sometimes we don't. Um, if there's a new patient, we spend more time with that new patient mm -hmm. if they're comfortable talking. Right. Because sometimes they want to, and other times they'd rather just sit there and listen to everybody else's story. Mm -hmm. But we all take a turn and, you know, talk two to five minutes. Yep. Yeah. Um, just to let everybody know what's going on. Because like I said, it, it, if you're attending regularly, you become this little family. Yeah. So this way, everyone gets a chance to check in, mm -hmm. see what's going on since the last month or the last couple months. Yeah. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, if nobody new is there, we'll talk about a specific topic if somebody wants to. Yeah. Um, we talk about the upcoming lupus news or not lupus news, but lupus events, or yep. if somebody, something new has been in, we'll even yeah, discuss that because yeah. not, not all of our patients end up seeing what's on the website yep. or the newsletter. Mm -hmm. They get busy with their lives too. Yep. So, yeah, where well, they got 85 emails that day and they missed, you know, one or, you know, <laughs> yes. social media or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, the, the main thing is checking in with each other and mm -hmm. just making sure we're all where we need to be. Right. And if somebody needs that extra help being there for them. That's awesome. Um, and then is, you know, kind of um, piggybacking off of that a little bit, because I think some people get confused between a facilitator and a patient navigator and you're obviously both so you're probably the one of the best people to speak on that so like when you know somebody's like what does a patient navigator do i guess would be the best way to start that patient navigator will help you see how to phrase this we're, we're kind of like you're all in one person mm -hmm. um if you need information as to okay so I, I'm calling in, I end up getting connected with the patient navigator. Mm -hmm. I can help you get connected with the um, with Rita to do the new patient orientation. Mm -hmm. I can get you the information for the support groups mm -hmm. and what type of information you're looking for. Um, I can lead you to where the resources are if you need a rheumatologist. We have a list of rheumatology. Mm -hmm. um, if you need extra help, like getting to transportation to your doctor's mm -hmm. office, um, durable medical equipment. If you need to borrow a walker and yeah. your insurance doesn't pay for it, we have resources right. for just about anything that we've put together for the state of Ohio. And we can help you connect with that. Yeah. Um, if even if you're not going to a support group and you want someone to check on you once a month, yeah. we'll make that phone call to check on you and mm -hmm. see how you're doing if you need anything. Um, you know, it's almost like you're a little personal lupus assistant. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, you that's know, way to think of it. Well, that's awesome. Um, yeah, because I think, you know, a lot of people in part of it's our fault. I think we do so much, um, that we don't always, nor do we have the space or the bandwidth to explain absolutely everything we do, you know, exactly. as far as like even the little things like with the walkers and stuff like that, that mm -hmm. you mentioned, like we have resources for that. I think obviously we, the important stuff is education, awareness, support, right. you know, that kind of stuff we harp on a lot, um, you know, our uh, assistance programs and stuff, but there's a lot of little things too that I think, you know, we, because we're here every day, we kind of, forget mm -hmm. to like that. Oh, yeah, that's probably people probably don't know that we do that. Um, exactly. So yeah, no, there, there definitely is a lot to it. And unless you know something specific that you're looking for on the website, you may not. Yeah, see exactly. It on the website, yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, 
but yeah, we're, we're here to help with whatever way we can. And if we can't, if we don't know it, we'll get you connected with whoever does have that information right. that can help you. So, well, and then you guys, I know you actually month is it? <laughs> I think you guys uh, are still, to, still November. Yeah, <laughs> I think you guys are still doing this right now, but you have been as you do, uh, you know, multiple times a year as you call everybody. We do, you know, if, even if you haven't heard from them, you know, exactly. so you're doing your, your wellness calls now. Usually um, quarterly, we go yeah. through the list of all the lupus patients that have mm -hmm. registered with the foundation. And we give them a phone call. Um, if we don't have an active phone number, we'll reach out to you via email if you've given us an email. Mm -hmm. Just checking in to see how you're doing, um, if there's anything you need, if you still want us to yeah. check in on you. You know, it just, yeah. but yeah, quarterly you'll get called by your patient navigator. And then, um, you know, like me, since I'm a patient navigator and support group facilitator, yep. you'll hear from me monthly. So. Yeah. yeah, you're in that unique position where it's like you're calling, you're calling people from your support group yeah. potentially where it's like, hey. <laughs> you know, I, I have a lupus <laughs> patient right now. I sent them a message on Tuesday. I know that they read the message and they haven't called me back. Oh, you're that, in trouble. That That isn't typical of this person. So <laughs> Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. Since I'm in the area, I'm probably going to be knocking on that person's door today. <laughs> there you go. House calls. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I know you said, you know, if you need to be called monthly in some instances. Yeah. I know that Rita has, you know, a few patients that she calls every month too. And Yeah, we do. Know, we, we have some people that they actually would like us to call monthly just to make sure that they're doing okay. And, yeah. And then also we always let our lupus patients know that if they need to reach out to somebody to please call the office, Right. that, you know, somebody in the office will connect you with a patient navigator or support mm -hmm. group facilitator. We don't, you know, don't ever want any of our lupians to feel like they're, they're alone. alone and that mm -hmm. they can't talk to somebody. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that that's something that Suzanne always harps on, mm -hmm. um, you know, just because she's, she's a historian. It's actually kind of funny. Um, she, so there's not too many people that can say this about really anything, but like she's not only a historian of the LFA as a national body, cause she's been involved, but she's almost like a lupus historian too, because oh, yeah. it's a recent, um, a recently prevalent, mm -hmm. you know, disease as far as research and the ability to treat it properly and stuff like that. And obviously there's still a lot of work to do, but oh, yes. she's, she's seen it from, you know, infancy almost all the way through yeah. uh, to current day. So She's in that unique position where organizationally she's a historian uh, for our national you know, body and all of the chapter network and everything, but also just as a disease as a whole. Oh, yeah. And she she will share absolutely everything that she's learned along the way to absolutely anybody. I've watched her do it. She it's, has a wealth of knowledge. She does. She does. I wish I had all that knowledge. <laughs> yeah, I know. And she her recall. Her, her, well, so her recall is really good about stuff that uh, she... Uh, like lupus and stuff like that. But when it's something that you told her, she conveniently does not recall that very well. <laughs> so, you know, we, we talked about this, you know, but. Uh, I, I, I think we all might be that way at times though. <laughs> no, we are. I know. She's, she's laughing right now, just in case anybody <laughs> was wondering, I'm not going to get in trouble. I don't think. Um, no, but that's awesome that, you know, uh, you know, as a facilitator, obviously you get more of that informal uh, vibe group mm -hmm. setting, um, you know, once a month, well, for you, yeah, it seems like five times a month with all the groups that you do. But <laughs> but then as a navigator, you can kind of take that more serious, like, hey, seriously, how are you doing that one-on-one? Right. -on -one, you know, nobody's listening. There's not a group mm -hmm. setting. You can really tell me what's going on, um, you know. Um, and I think that's important because I think everybody, some people might get intimidated with a single person calling. Right. And it's like, I don't really want to tell this random person. But then some people might be intimidated sharing that in a group setting, too. Mm -hmm. So having both of those, I think is important. Yeah. Um, we were just talking about our public speaking challenges before this. And I, I said that if it's people I know, I get terrified. If it's people I don't know, I'm fine. I'll, you know, so I well, think and, everybody's and different. Thinking of, as you mentioned, the public speaking, something that popped into my head about the patient navigators also is that if you're with an organization and ever want someone to come out and talk to your organization to give them more information about lupus, mm -hmm. the patient navigators will do that for you also. Yeah. 
So you know, you know they're they're walking lupus radio and commercial and billboards and <laughs> bus cards. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's they're they're definitely great resources to have, and I know that's something Suzanne's proud of, and you know everybody here, um, and even our state representatives are very proud that they um, have supported. We you have know. big shoes to fill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, we do. Yes, we do. We're constantly reminded by that. Um, so it just kind of you know wrapping it up, so to speak, um, a couple things. One, you know, if there's somebody that happens to find their way across this, um, that's, you know, in Ohio and has access to our resources, um, being a patient, what would be the one thing that you say that the LF, the LFA GOC helps with the most or could help with the most as far as like, what, it, what's it helped you with the most? The support. Yeah you know, connecting me with other Lupians, whether it be the walk or the support groups, but, you know, just that connection and knowing that I can call the office or mm -hmm. somebody else with the Lupus Foundation, even as a friend that I can talk to, yeah. you know, I, I, I really feel that having that support and that empathy is critical. Yeah. Yeah. That, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and then, um, to piggyback off of that, um, if you could share, it doesn't have to be one thing, I guess, if you have multiple, but um, what do you think like the most important things for, you know, recently diagnosed patient, you know, no family history. So nobody to lean on that um, also has lupus, um, you know, in their immediate uh, support group. What do you think the, the most important things for them to, to learn, understand, and know is? Um, especially if you're new, keep track of your symptoms mm -hmm. and how you feel, maybe even your activities, because that can affect what you're doing. Make sure you have a very good relationship with your medical team. Mm -hmm. um, don't leave information out when you're talking to them, because sometimes even what you eat or what you're doing can help them yeah. in treating your lupus. They are connected on their dot over exactly. here. And it's like, oh, that makes um, yeah. it. But, make sure that they know um, and make sure that you have a medical team that you're comfortable with. You yeah. know, you can email them if you need to, or through your patient portal or whatever, but you, I, I think having that critical or that, that good relationship with your medical team is critical in your lupus journey mm -hmm. and patients. Um, one thing that I have heard from a lot of lupus patients is, you know, you need, they need to be more patient with the process of medications. Um, medications do not work overnight. I've talked to a lot of people that, you know, like I said, Plaquenil is usually the first thing they start you off on. Mm -hmm. It can take up to six months of it getting into your system before you start to see the effects. Right. And a lot of people want that quick fix mm -hmm. of, okay, I've been on it for two or three weeks. It's not helping. Right. Um, and I, I know it's so hard to do when you feel so crappy, Yeah. but you've, you've got to give your medical team time to try the medications and follow what you're, what they're telling you to do to see if it's effectively working or not. Right. Um, and then connect with somebody, you know, yeah. even if it's just one person or whether it's a support group, talking to somebody really helps. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I think uh, the, the thing you said about patients, I think a lot of that probably, you know, obviously not in your case, you were lucky to be diagnosed relatively quickly. Um, but I think that patience is probably the, there's been such a journey yeah. to even get here exactly. that once you figure out, all right, cool, it's been, that's a relief. That's awesome. And then you started the treatment and it's like, what do you mean? Now I have yeah. to wait. Yeah. So that, and, that probably has a lot to do with it. And finding that right medication or even combination of medicines, yep. unfortunately, isn't always a quick fix. For yep. somebody, the Plaquenil may be enough. For yep. somebody else, you might have to go through. And unfortunately, anymore, it's not your doctors that you have to deal with when it comes to the medications. It's your insurance companies. Yeah. Because a lot of times they will veto what your doctor wants to put you on. Mm -hmm. And you've got to go through those hoops Right. So unfortunately, it can be a long, yeah. a long couple of years before you get that right. Mm -hmm. But 
you know. And that's actually a, a added benefit probably to a support group um, with the insurance because they can kind of give you maybe some tips. I'm like, oh yeah, that happened to me or I got vetoed for this exactly. and this is kind of how we figured that out. Yeah. So yeah, that's a that's another thing that just kind of popped into my head. And also remember what what may work for one lupus patient may not work for another. Yeah. So it's everybody's individual and every lupus case is individual. So, yeah. you know, trying yeah. as hard as it is at times, try not to get discouraged. And that's one of the big things about the support groups yeah. like we had talked about is, you know, you get to hear those other stories mm -hmm. and, you know, find out that you're not in this alone. And, you know, it took right. so-and-so three years before. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, Lisa, thank you for coming on. Thank you for joining us me. today. Um, I, one one thing you'll get to do because you have so many is why don't you plug all of your support groups real quick when they meet, <laughs> where they meet, um, how they meet. Okay. So the first Tuesday of the month, well, first of all, there's no support groups for the month of December. Mm -hmm. We do take December off because families are usually busy, you know, with the holidays. So starting in January, um, the first Tuesday of the month, we have our monthly call in, which is also being switched over to virtual. Mm -hmm. So make sure you check the lupus calendar and your emails for that information. But you'll be able to join us virtually or on the phone, whichever you prefer, the first Tuesday of the month. The second Tuesday of the month is the Akron Support Group. They meet, oh, sorry, the monthly call-in is from 7 to 8. I didn't forgot about the time. The Akron support group is hosted by Natalie, but that's at the Goodyear branch mm -hmm. of the Akron, Akron Library. Um, and they meet the second Tuesday of each month from 6.30 to 7.45. The third Thursday of the month is a non-denominational virtual prayer group. So if you're somebody that believes in prayer, I don't care if you're Catholic, Buddhist, Baptist, whatever. <laughs> if you belong, if you believe in prayer, that's the group you want to come to. Um, and that is the third Thursday virtually from seven to eight. And then the fourth Tuesday of each month is We Live With Lupus. And that's hosted here at the Brexville office. And that is from 7 to 8.30. And we were running virtually and in person. And starting in January, we're going to be back to in-person only. So if you have those and then the others, I can't think of off the top of my head. <laughs> but we have multiple support groups. Yeah. So make sure you get plugged into one for 2024. Yep. Yeah. You'll, you'll reap the benefits both ways as a patient and as a supporter. Yeah. Um, yeah. And as far as all the other support groups, that's okay. Cause I don't have them all memorized <laughs> either. That's why we have the calendar. Um, but you can find them all on our website, lupusgreaterohio.org, um, under the find support tab on that. Yes. Um, as well as on our social media, um, we post those, um, usually at the beginning of every month, we post the calendar mm -hmm. for the month. Um, McKenna does a great job with that. We also send out reminder emails. Um, once you're established in yes. the group, we'll remind you, um, you know, every month that the group is coming up. Um, and we also send out press releases for those every month too. Uh, so local newspapers, websites, radio, um, that kind of stuff. Uh, some of them will mention those as well. Um, and if you need anything else from the LFA GOC, you can always give us a call. one no lupus I know that put a smile on Suzanne's face. Um, you can email us at info at lupusgreaterohio.org. Um, and it's specifically for the podcast or just sharing your story in general, if you want to join Lisa and, uh, you know, share your story, um, in order to kind of provide some insight to fellow Lupians in Ohio, you can email me personally at alex at lupusgreaterohio.org. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Alex. Right. Have a good day. And Remember, cut. There is no I in lupus, but there is an us. Until next time, this has been my lupus living room with the Lupus Foundation of America's Great Ohio Chapter. For more information and resources to help you in your lupus journey, please visit lupusgreatoohio.org or call 1-888-NO-LUPUS. The funding for my lupus living room is an earmark from the state of Ohio and managed by the Ohio Department of Health. Your physician is the best person to help you in the treatment of lupus. The information you learned here today can be discussed with your doctor as your physician knows your medical history best. 
Please do not make any medical changes without consulting your physician first. As with any treatment, stay educated and get information from, from trusted sources.